uh, I would like to give you an insight into the 40 textile recent um, developments. And uh, very much, I would also thank Hannah Kelbel, which uh, of course is one of the leading researchers in my group dedicated to 4D textiles. Um, and here we have some results. And what you can see already from the picture, 4D textiles is not really a textile, but much more a structure. And I will give you later an insight of what uh, is all about this tessellated structure. So of course, um, you know all 3D printing, we using 3D printer, but the main secret is that we combined it with the pretension textiles. And um, this is the main key. Uh, so for D materials, I think the entire conference is all about, you know, this means that you print in 3D, but you print a material which um, ch changes its shape due to stimulus, shape, um, memory poly polymer in this case. And um, yeah, the, and of course, this is 4D materials, but here we talk, uh, we use, of course, the, the question is not only for fancy stuff, but can we use, for example, 4D materials for example, as a gripper. And as a gripper, you can, of course, use the, the 4D material directly, or you can use the tension and the bars as a kind of uh, mechanical reinforcement. <clears throat> and actually, um, just to already uh, disclose a secret, this is more or less what uh, nature does, um, because nature combines always um, different kind of method. So this is, of course, 2015, when at MIT, uh, the 4D material topic with Ms. Professor Tippett was developed. And just a year later, I thought, how can we bring this into or onto textiles? And this was the start, actually, of 4D textiles. You can see here the print onto a pretensioned knitted fabric and you use the membrane tension plus the bars in order to have an extraordinary shape of uh, change of shape and this actually is with what what nature uses if you go for um a bat wing or whatever and also with some leaves you have this combination about membranes and bars and so i've um, 2016, I um, formulated 40 textiles as structures and textile products that can change shape or function over time. And it's always a combination. We have a file to patent. If you take then <clears throat> the different um, paragraphs of the patents, then you will see that it is a combination of pretensioned, highly elastic textiles plus rigid bars. Okay. It's always um, the question, nice definition, but what does it make mean? Here we have uh, one of the prototypes we were working, looking for applications, for example, an application in medical use for older people who lost force to grip. And the question is, how can we support? And um, this was one of the first prototype. In order to make this kind of figure, we had to use a rotary device. So we developed a special device to um, control uh, the textile in the printing zone. So this also underlines that we from the Institute for Textile Machinery, we also not only doing the product, we also develop machinery. And um, here you can see, um, taking this finger and giving it a stimulus, um, then although those polymers have only a small change of shape, but in addition with the membrane and uh, this 4D structure, you achieve a tremendous change of um, shape, change of shape. Okay, so we did a lot of this stuff. And the question is, what are the challenges to overcome? Not only to make fancy videos, uh, but also to make it real, a real used material, uh, which uh, many engineers can use. Um, 
the first of all, you have to create uh, design principles. And here you have to differentiate uh, about the uh, micro, the meso and macro layer. And it's, I think it's the same concept which you find in many textile application or composite. Um, but of course, here in a different um, interpretation. So the uh, micro part is, for example, the membrane and the beam. The composition of that forms an elementary cell, for example, a ring, a square, or triangle. And then you, by using tessellation out of this basic geometries, you define an entire system. This is a macro um, level. To give you one example, the micro level is the membrane. It can be warp knit, weft knit. It can also be woven, uh, but mainly uh, knitted structures have a much higher elastic elongation. And then you combine it with a rod or a tile. And then you compose it into, for example, this single structure. And then you, out of this uh, meso basic structure here, a triangle, um, a triangle with different bars, and therefore it sh shapes already three dimensional. Then you tessellate it into here a hexagonal structure and it becomes a system. And it must be said that um, we very much use a bimodal stability. So you have, like you have here, once you pressure, 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 and sooner or later it flips into a second stable position. This is simple for a simple beam. Everybody knows of it. It's in uh, mechanics one very early in the um, uh, education. Uh, but of course, to describe it, and to describe it when it becomes a complex geometrical shape is still challenging. Because um, this change of shape can be utilized in different manners. For example, one is shrinking. So here you have tiles and um, the membrane plays only a minor role, but the different uh, arrangement of tiles can still lead to a large degree of deformation. The second is folding. For example, you can not only have rigid hinges, but you can have flexible hinges. And then like in a shampoo closure, for example, shampoo lid, um, you have a preferred um, movement around this flexible hinge. And you avoid um, a deflection in the around the other corners. And then, of course, you have the effect of bending, <clears throat> like you can see here in the smaller beam, but also in the larger beam. So these are the basic, let's say, deformation principles. If you have such a complex system, uh, the basic principle is very easy to catch. Um, but it becomes, of course, um, very versatile if you not only play with the basic structure, because these are all rectangles, but if you play with the arrangement of the rectangles and as well as the shape of the rectangles. So although everything is here composed uh, out of rectangles, the deformation behavior is totally different. Um, so you can play with the arrangement, you can um, play with the size um, of the basic um, pattern, and of course you can play with the size uh, of the beams included, and as you've seen in the previous example, this has also a tremendous effect. So this is one thing, so you, that you use the methods of distillation and also the method of, let's say, synergetical uh, approach from micro, meso, macro. But then, of course, uh, it becomes difficult to do it in a, let's say, um, mathematical, numerical, precise engineering way. A very important step is just do it. So the experimental phase is definitely the key. 
And you find this uh, also very often in the Southeast Asian hemisphere, in Korea and Japan, that people are not so much going into mechanical description of the system, but much more in the uh, creative and experimental way. I'll give you one example. Uh, so the, if you can want to utilize those movements, you again can think, how can I imitate um, biological systems? Here, a crab. And here, sorry, and then here, a kind of abstract um, um, model of it. And we have, not today, but in another presentation, we showed that if you have an arrangement, different arrangement of the flaps, the bending part, you can achieve a large variety of different movements, symmetrically, asymmetrically, and so on. Yes, I always say complexity kills the cat. This, I, I must say, this is a stone proverb. It's from McKinsey. And um, you have to keep it simple. In, if you want to bring uh, a new technology, a new concept down the road, um, you just have to provide easy solutions. And therefore, as uh, together with Hannah Kelvin, I said, well, can we have just a starter kit that everybody in the world can order and try. And this was one of the first uh, boxes, the 4D textile toolkit. So you get it in a box. In the box, there is some textiles. There is some uh, frame framework uh, from cardboard uh, or plywood. And then you have also some clamps that you can have an easy manual way to uh, do the pretensioning. 50%, 10%, you can easily adjust with the scale. Um, and you have also the materials for the printing. And then, of course, you have a small booklet, what you can do with this basic set. Uh, this was very clever. And a lot of people who have a 3D printer just try it and then experience it and then like it and maybe do get, take a step further. So this is a typically low-level lo low entry for everybody into the experimental world of 4D textiles. Of course, um, we are working in our, Aachen is very famous for production technology. We have here the only excellence cluster for production where some hundred um, research work together on the future of production. And one is of course, the production of soft structures. And here we are in the lead. And here we do two things because it's internet of production. So we have to think, can we describe the product and simulate it? This is on the left side. And uh, can we also develop products out of it? But then of course, how can we combine it with uh, advanced manufacturing? So we have, for example, developed um, a movable 3D printer, we have developed different uh, devices to manipulate the textiles. We have here used uh, a 3D inkjet printer plus um, a, uh, a pick and place um, equipment for the electronical part, the heating part, for example, for some of the 4D textiles. And then of course we um, developed uh, an integrated production system. So this of course is in the doing, Maybe the next conferences, I will present more results, um, which are not only developing and fancy structure, but also showcasing the automated and model-based um, design and production of 4D textiles. Thank you very much for your kind attention. <laughs>